<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, tonight's an item I'm really looking forward to um, when young Robert Beale speaks to us. But before I introduce him, just two quick announcements to make. Uh, the first is that the next CRSC meeting is on Wednesday the 8th of March when the Operations Director of CalMAC will address us. Unfortunately, I'm travelling in Canada at that point, so we'll not be here, uh, which is annoying uh, because it'll be a most interesting talk. But uh, Jim Sterling, uh, who is your Vice President, he will kind of host the meeting, if you will. I've also been asked by a friend of the club, Duncan Wilson, just to announce that the next West Highland Steamer Club meeting will be held on Thursday the 23rd of February, but it's going to be in Motel 1, which is from 78 to 82 Oswald Street in Glasgow, not the Partick Free Church Hall Thornwood Terrace as previously advertised. So just make sure that you go to the right venue. That meeting will commence at the normal time of 7.30. On to tonight, a talk I'm really looking forward to. Uh, Robert Beale, uh, who is young, which actually is quite an interesting <laughs> thought looking at, at the rest of us. Uh, but he's been a member for... Um... <laughs> okay, I'll just take that one back. Um, he's been a member for 15 years uh, and he's also a past committee member. He's spoken to the club before, I th think it was on the Loch Class uh, Calmac uh, Small Ferries or the... Yeah, or, and, and yes, indeed. Um, he is currently a skipper with Windermere Lake Cruises and is currently in charge of their new ship, Swift. So Robert's going to talk to us about uh, Lake Windermere and we look forward to his talk. Robert. Can you all hear all right? Yeah. So some of you know me, some of you don't. For those of you who don't know me, haven't sailed with me, like Robin said, um, skipper on Windermere, been there since 2007. Um, and this talk, it's about an hour, and uh, it's about the history of the lake, the passenger services, and how the lake has helped the local area develop over the years. So starting with this picture here, uh, which shows three ships down at Lakeside, this scene hasn't really changed at all, apart from uh, two of the boats. Uh, the one that's leaving is the Turn from 1891. We've still got her. Swan in the middle, uh, the first Swan, not the Swan some of you sailed on. And then at the back here, it's Teal or Signet. But apart from the back two boats, that view's very similar today. The buildings are the same. Most of the bollards are the same. There's a couple I've taken out with a digger, but apart from that, it's all the same. But I'm going to go right back to the beginning as we carry on. Uh, right back to 8,000 years ago. Oh, that's not working. Sorry. There we go. Um, so the first people to come to the Lake District about 8,000 years ago were Neolithic settlers. And you might wonder why I'm going back that far, but um, we think they used the lake for transport. There was a, a factory, they called it, up in the Langdales, where they used to quarry really high quality stone, which was used to make axe heads. And these axe heads have been found in Morecambe, Wales, Cornwall, and even Spain. So it's nice to think that they would use a lake for transport to avoid the boggy, marshy surrounding areas. After they left, we know nothing until the Romans came along. And they kind of conquered the area, controlled it, didn't leave much behind them when they left apart from ruins. But they used the lake. Collingwood, who excavated the fort at Ambleside, some of you have probably been to, found the remains of a, a Roman wharf. And when they were digging on Belle Isle, they found a Roman mosaic floor. So it's likely that they also used the lake. The Vikings came through slightly differently to the Romans. They had a much more lasting impression. They settled, farmed, bred their way into the area. Um, they've left their mark on the area, the location of settlements, the names of settlements, and of course, the Herdwick sheep, which litter the fells. But the first documented use of the lake is the monks of Furness Abbey. Uh, the abbey was established in 1127. And in 1246, they were allowed to fish on Thurston Water and Windermere. And Thurston Water is the old name for Coniston. Um, and that is the first documented use of the lake. So that's just setting the scene a bit for you. Yeah. The lake supported a lot of minor industries um, over the ne next thousand years. Um, abundant woodland around the lake allowed for wood managing and 
coppicing. Uh, coppice, coppicing wood, for those of you who don't know, is where you make one tree have about seven or eight shoots. So, coppiced wood would be used for creating charcoal, which would be used for iron smelting. There's a lot of iron ore down in Barrow that was brought up to the lake to be smelted. Um, bark was peeled from the trees for turning animal skins into leather. Uh, bark was also used to make spelt baskets, that's one of them. A uh, common basket around Cumbria, watertight if they were made well. But what I'm trying to get across to you is that prior to the introduction of steam and tourism, that the lake wasn't just a, a deathly quiet place with nothing going on. It was a hive of activity, maybe not like what you'd expect today, but there was boats like this one. This is Elizabeth, about 1850, she was built for Coniston Copper Company. She's still in existence at the Windermere Steamboat Museum. And she's typical of the type of boat used. Originally, they'd be rowed, even sailed, but latterly towed by a steam launch up and down the lake. Up at the northern end, there was a slate wharf. That's where all the slate quarries are. Um, if you're familiar with Clappers Gate, that's the quite obvious Clappers Gate bridge there uh, over the River Rothay. And the wharf was at the confluence of the rivers Rothay and Brady. This cottage is known as the Ferryman's Cottage, although I won't go into it, it's a whole other talk, but it had nothing to do with the ferry, uh, in my opinion. But um, it has a belfry there, which I think was probably used to summon a cargo boat traversing the lake. Uh, because just behind it was an old uh, threshing and corn mill. Now moving on from cargo to passengers, the lake formed a kind of highway for those wanting to move heavy cargoes, but if you're trying to move east to west, it forms a barrier. Um, the ancient counties of Lancashire, Westmoreland and Cumberland uh, used to meet up in the Little Langdale Valley, and whereas the whole lake is now in Cumbria, uh, it used to be in the Westmoreland, in the north, the top right side, and the left and bottom right side was in Lancashire. So a number of ferries crossed from east to west. Up at the northern end, the very debatable Milligrand Ferry. Locals will tell you it existed, it's cemented in tradition. There's no evidence, not even circumstantial, to support this theory, especially prior to 1840, when people started hiring out boats from Milligrand. Um, but like I say, I can do that in a different talk. The NAB ferry is still going today. Many of you will have been across it. It's where the car ferry uh, operates. Further south at Bellman Landing, there was a little ferry. Uh, that's just into Lancashire uh, back in the day, prior to 70, 1974. Um, and then at the bottom, uh, Miller Ground and Bellman were just rowing boats. Down at the bottom, we had a couple of Fords. And I mention them because when I get onto steam, these posed a bit of a problem and the... Uh, the river had to be dredged to allow the early steamboats to travel down uh, the river to the Swan Hotel. Uh, Felfoot Ford was uh, on the old turnpike road, you'd pay a fee, and it was marked out by big boulders, which if you travel down to Felfoot now, you'll see uh, an odd triangular shaped one called the Cheese Wedge, uh, which used to mark a dodgy little hole where people would often uh, slip into. Now, I've got a couple of pictures of the Nab Ferry, and then I'll move on to uh, the normal passenger boats. So this is a pretty big boat, as you can see. This chap here sat on the sweep, huge oar. And this was a small boat. Prior to 1635, they used huge boats. Um, obviously, no pictures exist. But in 1635, a very well-documented accident occurred on the lake where the old ferry capsized. And according to various sources, there were 11 horses and 47 passengers on board. Now, you'll get a lot on there, but I think you'll struggle to get that many on. After that incident, they definitely moved on to using smaller boats, but still pretty large, as you can see. It's got the uh, hinge brackets at the end there for the ramp, which you can see in the next picture. Um, this is the old ferry after it's been uh, decommissioned. It was used to move livestock to and from Belle Isle. But you can see the old ramp here. I think the cattle might have struggled to walk up and down that, but... Um, quite substantial boats. You notice the Carvel built, they're not clinker. Um, really nice boats. This one is still in existence, uh, not looking like that at the Windermere Steamboat Museum. The top picture, you might not recognise it, that's where the car ferry lands today. Nowadays, that lovely old traditional Lakeland um, inn has been demolished. It was demolished in 1880. It's the old ferry inn which can trace its roots back to 1586, so it was a really ancient inn. It was an important call on the lake. Um, 
the Ferry Hotel was built there in 1881. But you note how the overloaded cart is there with the, the horse anchored facing the middle of the boat. They used to make sure the horses were facing the centre of the vessel so they didn't get spooked and tip it over because nobody could really swim back then. Also of note is just behind here, that is the old uh, pier for the early steamboats. And we'll see some boats there coming up later on. I'm going to whiz through the next 100 years and then I'm going to go back in one slide. So just to get the NAB ferry out of the way. Um, four chain ferries have operated across the lake. Um, this is the first one, the 1870 ferry, top left. The old Coniston coach with the steps going up the side. Um, she was lopsided. She had her engine and boiler on one side. So she kind of went across the lake on a cant. Um, she also was forever breaking her lines and drifting onto uh, various islands. Now, if you can see as well on that uh, slide at the top, just in the back, there's a little boat. That's the Raven. That's Windermere's version of a puffer. Uh, so that picture was taken after 1871. This was our second ferry built by some Glaswegians in 1915. Uh, she was nicknamed the Iron Duke. Sat a lot more level. She had the boiler on one side, engine on the other. She lasted until 1954 when the Drake came along. Uh, I know some of you told me you sailed on Drake. Um, after 1960, she lost this big funnel when she was converted to diesel. And then since 1990, we've had this, the Mallard. Um, she's earmarked for replacement in the next couple of years by an electric vessel. They're currently digging up uh, Windermere to Bourness to lay a cable because um, we haven't got the infrastructure there yet. But um, the first one carried two cars, this one was four, this one was 10, this one's 18, and uh, the next one. Its footprint's not gonna be much bigger, but they're gonna get rid of this saloon to get, get a little bit wider uh, space on the car deck. So that's the east-west ferries, and we're gonna move on now to the uh, first tourists and how passenger transport developed on the lake. So prior to the 19th century, only the super rich owned their own businesses or came into money. The landed gentry would be going on holiday. You didn't get paid for it. They used to go to Geneva, to Lucerne, and then the Napoleonic Wars kind of shut off Europe to them. They looked at other places to go. I was in the Trossachs today, kept commenting how similar it is to uh, the Lake District, Sockland. I've just noticed that, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sockland is too far, but so was Scotland if they were coming from uh, London. You know, three or four day carriage ride just to get up here. The Wales, uh, Wales was nice, it had Snowdonia, but it doesn't have the same amount of lakes with islands on. But uh, the Lake District was kind of perfect. It was reachable in a couple of days from London. It had the advantage of the celebrities of the day populating the area, Coleridge, Wordsworth, the uh, ones who school children today despise. But um, these wealthy elite would come up, they'd fraternise with Wordsworth, um, Christopher North, who was from Edinburgh, who uh, founded Blackwoods magazine. And they'd tell everybody about it, and then more super rich would come. And a little trade developed where they'd go from these viewing stations to view these select views in the Lake District. And Clay Station is an example of one of these viewing stations. Uh, built on the shores of the lake, uh, travellers would go from viewing station to viewing station, marked on, you can see it's marked on the map, West's first station there. There were about six around the lake. But to get to these various viewpoints, they needed to go by boat. Uh, incidentally, this is Imp, a uh, lovely little steamboat that lives on the lake. So these, these travellers would be staying in hotels in Bourness. Windermere didn't exist back then. Uh, the village, the lake did. And... Um, They'd, uh, they'd come out of the hotel and the proprietor would say, uh, Billy Barmer's got a boat, he'll take you on a tour for two shillings. And after a while they realised they were missing out on money. So they started to create little fleets of their own, rowing boats down by the lakeshore. Um, William Garnet was another one. Garnet and Barmer are still very, in fact there's one of each who still work for us, probably related uh, to those boys from a couple of hundred years ago. And they take you on the set tour around the islands, very similar to a tour we still do today on the lake. Uh, this is taken from Belle Isle, or painted from Belle Isle, looking towards the village of Bourness. As you can see, there's nothing higher up the hill where the village of Windermere would be today. This is just a later image of 
Bowness. It's after 1869 when the Old England was built, but the rowing boats here, um, all locally built. Uh, Pre-1960, they were built out of six planks. If you, most of the ones we've got now are seven plankers from the keel up. Um, but these are the cushion huts, listed buildings now, um, where, as the name suggests, the cushions were kept and the uh, oars were tipped with uh, copper back then and aluminium now, just to stop them scraping on the floor. The boats are still available from those jetties today. Um, and these rowing boats have travelled far and wide. Bowness rowing boats, Derwent Water, Balloch, now in Windsor. Um, it's a, a good sturdy design for uh, novice rowers and pulled up beaches over and over and over again without damaging the hulls. But we're still at a time when it took a lot of time and effort to reach the Lake District, or what became the Lake District. The Black and White Canal, the Kendall Canal, uh, reached Kendall in 1819. It would still mean a three-day trek for a lap of the lake. Seven hours on the canal boat from Preston to Kendall. Spend the night, early morning coach to Bowness, Do a tour, coach back, boat back the next day. In 1835, uh, a steamer called Windermere started sailing from Liverpool to Ulverston, um, or Bardsea, if the tide was uh, not in its favour. Uh, Ulverston and Dalton were the the uh, county towns back then, Barrow didn't exist really. And uh, that was one way of reaching the area, but again, another three day trip was required. Trains were a bit later, uh, didn't reach Kendall in 1846 and Windermere in 1847. I don't expect you to remember all those dates, I'll bring them up again and again as we go through, but uh, the next few slides um, will show different forms of transport around the lake which developed due to the ease of people getting to the lake, if you catch what I mean. So John Allenby, who was running the boat from Liverpool to Ulverston, put the first passenger boat on Windermere that ran to a schedule. I only discovered this one a couple of years ago. I knew that Wordsworth had talked about a boat in 1836, um, but just one or two adverts mentioned this bit at the bottom. The, the little Windermere sails from Newby Bridge at 8 a.m. every day for Ambleside. These were rowing boats, we're not talking steamboats yet. A year later, an Ambleside greengrocer, James Gibson, popped a boat on a route between Bonus and Ambleside. Um, he uh, extended it to Newby Bridge after a couple of years, joined forces with Thomas White, who is a proprietor of the Swan Hotel, and they ran two boats around the lake. They didn't do full lake trips. They met in the middle at the ferry that we saw earlier on um, and then returned to their respective end. Gibson uh, was a little bit underhand when the first steamboat came on. He wrote letters to the uh, paper claiming to be a passenger who'd had a really bad experience and <laughs> uh, just signed the letter with a resident. Um, <laughs> But uh, the, the paper found out and printed their own reply the following week, but I haven't put that in. Now, these were really successful. Um, Gibson and White ran until 1846, and the only reason they stopped is because the first paddle steamer was put on the lake. So it's all steamboats from now on. So here we go. This is the Lady of the Lake, the first um, paddle steamer built for services on Windermere, built by Ashburners of Greenodd. They, that, that, that shipbuilding yard started out on the Isle of Man, moved over to Greenodd. They kept a yard in the Isle of Man, the family kind of split. And uh, later they had a yard at the new town of Barrow. Lady of the Lake was a small boat. Um, she was designed to be able to do the mile and a half from what's now Lakeside down to Newby Bridge, down the River Leven. This is a particularly bony stretch of river. Um, and she was designed to be able to turn around down there within the width of the river. She's seen here at uh, Bowness. She wasn't received well. I've already said about Gibson writing a letter about her. Uh, William Wordsworth, uh, he was distraught at the fact that, well, poor people would be able to reach the Lake District uh, by the coming train and attracted by the railway. And a lot of the other local gentry who'd made the South Lakes their kind of private playground, wrote lots of eulogies in the papers and the magazines uh, about it. And all that did was attract more people. And despite not entering service until July and finishing in September, she carried 5,000 people 
Again, this is 1845. The railway was only in um, Kendal. It hadn't reached Windermere, so it was still quite a bit of effort to get here. Preempting the success. Sorry, she was built for the Windermere Steam Yacht Company, local uh, landowners and uh, businessmen from Ulverston um, who could see the trade that would come up through Liverpool. And seeing the success that she was uh, developing, they ordered a second vessel, um, Lord of the Isles, which I'll come to in a moment. I forgot to put extra slides in this morning. This is the launch of uh, Lady of the Lake at Lakeside in typical fashion, greatly exaggerated <laughs> in uh, size. But as you can imagine, due to her age, there's very few images of her. Gibson and White continued to operate for the first year, their passage boats, their rowing boats, in opposition. They tried the hardest to avoid um, the steamer. Don't try and decipher that. They've got to part and arrive the wrong way around, and it's really confusing. But at half past two, you'll see that um, there's a simultaneous departure from Newby Bridge. Um, but yeah, it's all over the place, that timetable. There's a reprinted one a couple of weeks later, but by then, these guys had dropped out. Um, but yeah, uh, she was faster, she was cheaper, and uh, she, the, the little paddle, uh, passage boats couldn't compete. Now the next steamer, Lord of the Isles, built for the Windermere Steam Yacht Company, again by Ashburners of Greenod, is a bit of an odd uh, craft, because the only pictures we have of her are as a burnt-out wreck. She had a pitifully short career on the lake. She was almost the same. She was three tons heavier than Lady of the Lake. She was the same length, a couple of feet wider. Um, she lasted four seasons before she ended up being burned. I'll come to that later on. Um, but here she's seen as a hulk in Bowness, and here she's seen as a hulk in Bowness uh, on the right-hand side there with Lady of the Lake on the left. She lasted as a hulk for over 10 years. Um, I could never work out when she left, and then uh, a few months ago I found adverts auctioning off her hull uh, nine years after she burnt. But she looks like she's been used as a storeroom here for you know, bits of wood and things like that. And if you're unfamiliar, or if, even if you're familiar with the bay, this is where our Pier 3 would be. So it's right on the promenade, um, which didn't exist then, but you know, right where all the people would be coming down to the lake. And you can, it's a good picture of Lady of the Lake there though, shows her size off. You can see the signs as well. This is taken in Bourness, but that says Newby Bridge because the uh, one side of the pier was for Newby Bridge, one was for uh, Waterhead. Lord of the Isles, Lady of the Lake, didn't do a two boat timetable. They only ever sailed one boat, and if it was busy, Lord of the Isles sailed at the same times. The Windermere Iron Steamboat Company arrival was set up in 1847. Uh, some of the directors. Um, I think had links with the newly opened railway to uh, Windermere. And a couple of years later, they launched their first iron steamboat, which is Firefly. This is the only image that exists of Firefly. Um, she's an iron hull hulled vessel, and this company built two boats. One of them was double ended, so this can only be Firefly. Um, she was faster, she burnt less coal, uh, she was smarter than the two older boats, and they put her on a ridiculous timetable five laps of the lake, starting from Bowness. Nowadays, a lap of the lake takes three hours. Back then, it took about three and a half. And I've done a few four-lap days, even a four-and-a-half-lap day, and you're talking 14, 15 hours. So her five-lap day, with extra calls at the ferry and the low wood, was, it wasn't achievable. And she got a really bad reputation. She kept on going off for charters for her directors and uh, private trips for um, directors' friends. And at the end of the year, it, she'd made such a bad reputation that she spent three weeks offering free trips for all the local school children in an effort to try and uh, recoup some, some uh, merit. There's one other picture which every other publication will tell you is Dragonfly, her sister ship. Uh, but I think it's Firefly. Here it is. Um, this is at Bowness. Again, she's not a double-ended vessel. It's got a... When you see it on the computer, it's got quite an obvious rounded stern. Um, but this is back in Bowness. <laughs> Again, this is now where we've got the cafe and all the rowing boats. And it's just well, the timber yard, as you can see. I don't even know what these are. Uh, but on the other side of the pier is the Raven. 
the Sea Ravens funnel and wheel. So this is taken after, again, 1871. The two companies operated an intense rivalry. It was ruinous. It was absolutely ridiculous. Um, so we got Lady of the Lake and Lord of the Isles here, Firefly over there, um, bow out. And, I mean, just, there's nothing there. Not even the Bells Field has been completed. And um, because the Lord of the Isles and Lady of the Lake couldn't compete with the speed of Firefly, the owners of the Firefly knew that to gain a good reputation, they just needed to race. So timetables for Firefly just said, refer to handbills of the steam yacht company and we'll run at the same times. So what did these guys do? They lowered the fares. So what did these guys do? They offered you a free bottle of beer. So what did these guys do? They offered you a free trip and a bottle of beer. It was never going to work and something had to change. This is some of the uh, timetables. This isn't the one where it says meet the other fare. Uh, we run together, but just uh, timetable for Lord of the Isles and Lady of the Lake from 1849 and one for Firefly. This was after her five lap timetable didn't work out. They brought her down to three and a half laps. But as you can see, she uh, marks, Firefly marks connections with the train uh, due to her director's connections with the railway. Second vessel for the Windermere Iron Steamboat Company came along in 1850. This is Dragonfly. You can see she's obviously double-ended. Um, she was 95 feet in length. And the reason she's double-ended is because a 95-foot boat couldn't turn around at Newby Bridge, where the Swan Hotel is. She was built in 1850, but wasn't handed over to uh, the Iron Steamer Company in 1851. So something significant happened between those two things, which was the burning of the Lord of the Isles. Um, the crew had gone home. They had the night watchman keeping the fires warm. He'd gone home for his tea, which he shouldn't have done. And they came back, and Lord of the Isles was ablaze. She was a total wreck. You've seen the pictures already. Uh, the two fire boys who worked for the steam yacht company, that's the company who owned Lord of the Isles, were taken to Appleby Assizes, charged with arson. And the judge quickly realised, using logic, that they wouldn't burn themselves out of a job. And nothing ever came of it. The boat was never replaced, but no one ever thought to look at the rival company, which was operating you know, very underhand tactics, which you've already seen. Um, there were rumours that the Iron Steamboat Company was stealing packages that were coming by rail for the Steam Yacht Company. So it's odd that the, the judge never thought to question the Iron Steamboat Company, but they never did. The other interesting thing about this picture, which is also on the next one, so I'll move on, is this building here. This is the old Toll House. This is the road that comes down to Bowness, Kendall. Uh, it was one of the turnpike roads after the Turnpike Act of 1769, and you'd pay your two shillings there. To go by boat from Bowness to Ambleside was one and six. So it was cheaper to go on the water than it was on the road for a while. That's the same boat, Dragonfly, at north side of the pier. Just There's absolutely nothing there at Ambleside. This is a little yacht called Wagtail, which belonged to MacIver, who's a Liverpudlian who... Yeah, you probably know it, a massive shipping business. And uh, the village of Clappersgate in the background in the Langdales. A very different scene because the YHA, the Esplanade building, hadn't been built yet. Now, the ruinous competition couldn't continue. In 1856, timetables started coming out saying, undersigned or by order of the Windermere United, oh, sorry, Windermere Iron Steamer Company and the Windermere Steam Yacht Company. And then in 1858, they officially formalised that and became the Windermere United Steam Yacht Company. I don't tell my wife how much I paid for this, the French uh, private postcard, but it was ridiculous. But what it shows is this picture was taken between 1858 and 1865. This is Dragonfly and this is Lady of the Lake, both with the same funnel colours. So it's when the uh, United Steam Yacht Company uh, was formed. Interestingly, they still did separate timetables. That one says Lady of the Lake. This one says uh, Dragonfly and Firefly. See, they've got the F and D. Lady of the Lake was becoming a little bit unreliable. She ran aground twice. Um, she had to be beached after she had a boiler problem and her engineer, some of you proper engineers will know 
more than me, but they released some valves and ran her ashore and ran off the boat before it exploded. And the United Steam Yacht Company looked at ordering a replacement. They went to the Loon Iron Shipbuilding Company, which was a relatively new company down near Lancaster, and they ordered this 105-foot vessel, the Rothay. Ordered in 1865, she came a year later. Last pedal steamer built for the lake, last vessel built for services to Newby Bridge. Uh, she's bow in there, her funnel was abaft the boxes. Uh, you can see the helm position, quite exposed. I quite like the double-ended boats, it's not something you see that often. Um, but uh, she, uh, she, she was built, but, uh, the last pedal steamer built for the lake. Next picture is a cracking one of her amble side. Uh, there she is, again, wagtails on the slipway, she hasn't moved since the, the last photo was taken. Um, but uh, another cracking image with the tall house on the left hand side. Is that the gift shop now? Is that, that, is the, that is the ticket office, yeah. The, they're all listed buildings, I mean, later on a warehouse was built there, which we'll see for the cargo boats. But um, yeah, the, uh, they're all listed buildings, we've just been repainting them and doing a lot of work on them this winter actually. Uh, but uh, yeah. So, the Windermere United Steam Yacht Company had a relatively short time on the lake, uh, 1858 to 1869, because in 1869 the Furness Railway started to get interested. They were building a railway to Newby Bridge to connect with the steamers, and then they decided, now nah, let's do one better. They bought a controlling share in the United Steam Yacht Company, 10,000 shares, and they extended the railway another mile and a half from its planned termination behind the Swan Hotel at Newby Bridge up to a place called Harrison's Landing which would later become Lakeside. Now the boats had been calling here for a while. There's Rothay again just down the bottom of the pier. If the river was high and the river was flowing it was difficult to navigate a 70 ton boat down there. If the river was low you were bouncing down damaging the boat. So they'd be landing here. The original pier at Harrison's Landing was literally an upturned car pushed in the lake with a plank on it. And, uh, yeah. and um, a little industry grew up because of how unreliable the passage to the Swan Hotel was. A, uh, a pub, an inn, um, the road was widened to allow carriages to take you down. Even boat hirers started at Harrison's Landing if you wanted to continue the journey by water. So the advantage of Lakeside... It's twofold, obviously more reliable service, a good rail connection, deeper water, deeper water means bigger boats with that newfangled screw propulsion, um, which means uh, more economy, more stability, just a much better idea. They built this hotel here, did the Furnace Railway, and this lovely building, this one's gone sadly, knocked down in the 70s. There it is, a front side view of it. And you'll see in this picture, and in that one, and if you see aerial pictures, you'll see this weird circular black thing in the middle of what's now the car park. That was the coal store. So the wagons would come up on the railway, the, the standard gauge wagons, go into that coal store. And then coming out of the coal store was this little tramway with hand-pushed carts, go down the pier. So all the way, there's the coal store. They come down here and uh, they'd coal up the steamers. And they, that continued right up until the 1950s. This is taken from Fell Foot, this bottom one. This is my favourite steamer on the lake. This is the first Swan, 1869. First boat built uh, with input from the railway. She built by Seths of Rutherglen, just up the road, as a lot of Lakeland boats were. We've still got a couple sailing that were built by them. Um, she was launched in 1869, about a week after the railway to Lakeside opened. Uh, she was 147 feet in length, so that's two foot longer than the turn that we still have. So she was quite a long vessel, very narrow saloon. You could actually walk right round that boat. And the next few boats had these absolutely stunning carvings on the bow, which sadly we don't see anymore. I, I changed the next picture on the train this morning because she didn't have the rosiest of careers. She was run into by the turn once and sank. And then w one day in fog, this happened. Um, she went ashore at uh, Belgrange. Now, Belgrange is, is, is a, 
it's very steep. It's very steep, and in the middle, there's a little flat bit where there's a, a road from Red Nab Car Park to to a house, and that's exactly where she, you know, there's a road. <laughs> she just went straight up in a fog. Uh, passengers came down this ladder, walked four miles to the car ferry, came across to uh, Newby uh, to, to to Bournemouth, and only six shillings compensation were paid to one lady who slipped down the ladder. Nobody else asked for any money back or anything. And as you can see, it became a bit of a tourist attraction. Um, but yeah, that's the one absolutely cracking boat. She lasted until 1938. She made her final trip at one o'clock on the same day at one o'clock when the second swan came down the slipway. So she was only put out of business by this. I think they should have renamed her and kept her, but uh, they didn't. A couple of years after the swan, we get the only single screw vessel built by the railway for services on the lake. This is Raven. Let's say our little version of a, a puffer. She was tiller steered. This is a picture of her centenary in 1971 and she was redone by uh, the Steamboat Museum. But um, yeah, little donkey boiler steered by a rib tickler uh, tiller. She carried everything. She carried beer, she carried uh, wood, she carried saltpeter, sulphur up the lake, she brought slate, limestone, everything, anything you can think of, general railway cargo, parcels, passengers, luggage. She had a very nice week, Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, she laid at the berth we still call the barges at Lakeside, where she loaded up, and then Tuesdays, Thursdays and Saturdays she meandered up the lake at half seven in the morning, uh, coming back down later on, and my next picture is one of my absolute favourites. Uh, there she is, coming in to uh, Waterhead, uh, with the crew on the front there ready to uh, catch her in. She's loaded up with wood there, and she's coming into. If you can picture Waterhead Pier, those of you who've been there, it's you know it sticks straight out into the lake. Well, running along, in a, you know, by the YHA, that's where her berth was. So she was out the way of the steamers, and the, what's now the cafe was her warehouse. And if you'd ordered goods in, you had to claim them within 48 hours, or they became the property of the railway company. This is the galley chimney on the front, uh, where they obviously had the little fire and did a bit of cooking. But, uh, she's still got the same crane today. Sadly, she's not in the water. The Steamboat Museum took her out. I sailed past one New Year's Eve 2015, and her and Esperance were floating. I came back a day later, and they both sunk. And they got lifted out a couple of days after that, and they've never gone back in the water since. But as we speak, she's getting a new deck laid but it's unlikely we'll see her in the water again, which is a real shame because, as you saw in the previous image, for a centenary, she was in fully working condition. Now, to the older steamers that we had, Lady of the Lake disappeared with the introduction of Rothay in 1866. Um, Firefly and Dragonfly lingered on, becoming ever more unreliable. They were slow. When you compared them to the Swan, they just couldn't compete. They were, people didn't want to travel on them, and they were increasingly mothballed down the end of the lake. The Furnace Railway reintroduced the winter timetable. I haven't, that's, again, I could talk about that for a while, the winter timetable. It was on and off, on and off, but the Furnace Railway reintroduced it in 1869. Swan wasn't really the most economical boat to run in the winter, so they ordered 200 foot twins from the uh, Barrow Shipbuilding Company. Now, that was based in Barrow. It shared directors with the railway company who owned the yacht company. So it was all interlinked. The, the client was the owner, was the builder. And uh, that's why they were launched. This is quite incredible, Victorian engineering. This one was launched on the 22nd of May, 1879. Her sister was launched from the same slipway on the 6th of June. They were transported in near complete condition from Barrow to Lakeside, uh, the railway track being slewed to the centre of bridges to allow greater, greater clearance. They didn't, of course, have all the railings and the funnels on, but Two weeks to launch two boats from the same slips, not bad. And we've got the, uh, the fan boards here, similar to what you had on the, some of the Clyde steamers, which uh, you couldn't really get lost on the lake, but they still had fan boards. I suppose at Bourness you had boats going different directions. Here she is again, coming into Lakeside, Signet. Um, Signet was the first one. Good for the winter service, small saloon with the steam running down either side under the seat, so it would have got quite warm in there. Sister ship, two weeks her junior, Teal. Um, here she is coming into Bourness. Um, looks identical, is identical. Quite hard to tell them apart. 
um, unless you can see the name. And here they are together up at Ambleside. An odd picture, neither of them are flying a flag, but they're both absolutely rammed and the gate's open, <laughs> which uh, we wouldn't really get away with today. I assume he's just about to come across the end. That guy looks like he's holding his rope to chuck it against the, uh, the, against the pier. Maybe if the gate was shut, he'd hit too many passengers. But, uh, they're all sat at the back, no, no, nobody at the front. Um, you can see as well on the bows of each boat, they've got the, uh, the lovely carvings. But yeah, th those boats lasted uh, through until, one of them until the 1920s, one of them until 1964. Take a little break from the steamers now, and uh, we're going to go for a little trip up the lake. So we've seen Lakeside. First stop was originally the ferry, but in 1891, Stores Hall became a hydropathic spa hotel. You probably sailed past this if you sailed with me or you sailed on the lake. We currently use this jetty for weddings. This is still there, Stores Temple, but this is the old steamer pier. Uh, it does remain in bits. Um, I'll show you that in the next slide. But the Stores, Stores Pier, Ferry Hotel and Lowood were request calls for a time. And once the railway came in charge, how do you make signals on a railway? You use a signal. So on the end of the jetties, they put semaphore signals. And if you wanted the boat to call um, at this one, there was no pier master. You did it yourself. You pulled the rope, up went the signal, boat would come in. This pier kind of exists today, just like that at the top, but uh, people often wonder what that is. So when you're looking from the lake and you see that, that's where the old pier is. And here is the magnificent first swift alongside. This pier was put out of use, as you can see in that slide, 1936, because of the introduction of teal. She was too big to get in. The hotel didn't really gain many passengers that way at that time, so they didn't bother upgrading the pier for Swan and Teal. After stores, five minutes through the dangerous part of the lake, known as the Midwater Shallows, would bring you to the Ferry Inn, the old place where Gibson and White would uh, exchange passengers. And here's the Rothay alongside the pier. This was a bit of a contentious pier. To, be to begin with, it was great. Everyone changed here for Coniston or Hawkshead, even Kendall. But this is, again, the old Ferry Inn, taken before 1881. Uh, Later owners of the ferry hotel, which replaced this building, saw the ferry as competition. When it was taking passengers from Bournemouth to the hotel and vice versa, the guys who leased the hotel also leased the ferry. So when the pier fell into disrepair, they didn't bother repairing it. For the first few times, the railway company pitched in and helped repair it. But in 1925, the LMS said, nah, we're not bothered. We just won't come in. And uh, so that's why the ferry stopped being a regular call on the lake. There's nothing left of that, that uh, area now. You can't tell. This is all just a lovely grass, straight, looks like entirely natural lake shoreline. Bourness next. You can get 10 postcards of Bourness and they'll all be different. It was forever changing. So this is where the picture I had before of the old England was taken from here looking this way. You know, we've got all the rowing boats and the cushion huts. Um, we've got, this is all gone, replaced by that big Aquarius building. But in later pictures, these boat sheds went all the way around to Cockshot Point and the aircraft hangars uh, during the First World War. But this is the old steamer pier. It's now extended to about here. We've got Esperance Pier, which we still call Esperance Pier. And the steamer Esperance is tied up there. Um, she's now at the Steamboat Museum. She doesn't really feature in this talk, uh, unless I've got time later on. Um, but it's a scene that, in some ways, it's unchanged, but in some ways, it's entirely different. But Bowness is the hub now. It wasn't then. Lakeside uh, was the, the hub of the uh, sailings. 20 minutes after Bowness, we come up to the Lowood. Again, we've got the Rothay at the pier. She crops up a lot. Um, on a southbound sailing there. So the Lowood sits on the old turnpike road where, the, where it first meets the shore of the lake. The oldest part of the current building, this bit, dates from 18. Uh, 59. There wasn't in here since 1769. And then before that, it was up here. This is the old Skelgill Lane. And Lowood Farm, which is now up there, was the old inn. So it really is uh, an ancient inn. Nowadays, it needs its own postcode. It's that big. It keeps expanding. 
but uh, we still call there on a few green cruises and for charters. I was in there the other day. Um, but what this doesn't show and what um, lots of people don't appreciate is running along here now is the main road up to uh, uh, Ambleside and Keswick. And the final call, Waterhead. Interestingly, the seam has bow in there. Uh, for those of you who can't tell them apart, it's difficult at that age. That's the Swan. For people who really want to be nerdy, she's got five windows there. Teal just had four. <laughs> um, here's the Esplanade, built in the 1890s. This is the cargo steamer's berth, uh, Raven's berth, and uh, the old warehouses there. Toll house. Not a toll house anymore by then. It probably wasn't the pet shop it is now, but it, the tolls have been abolished. Um, this is quite a late picture, probably uh, 1950s, because Romney's Hotel's there. But it's still the, still the uh, terminus of services, obviously, because we'd run out of water. Back to the boats, we've got the turn. We still have this one. I'm sure most of you at some point have sailed on her. I uh, spent eight years on that boat as mate and master. Uh, she's an absolutely cracking boat. Um, built, intriguingly, by forests of Wivenhoe and Essex, the only boat the Furnace Railway had built down there, sandwiched by sets of Rutherglen orders. So it, I don't know why they didn't come back up here. Um, two years prior to this, they'd built a boat for Ullswater, which was doing amazingly well, so maybe they just had a full order book. But Turn still sails today. She's um, in, converted from steam to diesel, over the winter of 1957 and 58, more on that later. She's seen here with the uh, Windermere Otter Hounds. And here, uh, the first Teal and Signet had this as well, but this is a primitive reversing gear. Obviously with these small boats, that lever just kind of continued down straight onto the engine so the skipper could uh, control the engine a little bit. We still have this wheel. Uh, it's hung up in uh, Pier 1, but uh, yeah. Possibly my favourite of the remaining ships that we have. Here she is leaving Bourness. Um, yeah. So I think that's uh, st that's still Furnace Railway days, that one. So pre-1923. Now the thing about Turn, she was quite narrow. She's 18 feet wide. I've been told this is unusual. I'm not an engineer. But this is a kind of pro side view. Her starboard engine drove the port shaft and the port engine drove the starboard shaft. As you can see here, due to the narrowness of the vessel, port engine, starboard shaft, starboard engine, port shaft. I've been told that's quite unusual, so I thought I'd include it. It's, uh, I haven't come across it before. But uh, that's all changed now, of course, because she's uh, diesel with two Cummins engines that go straight onto the 90 feet shaft. The first Swift, she was four foot wider than Turn. She was a Seth's vessel. And she was wider to accommodate the newfangled and really popular invention of the push bike. Uh, I don't know how many she carried, but that was written down as one of the reasons why she was uh, a bit wider. This is an absolutely fantastic image uh, of her coming into Bourness. Slightly J. Arthur Dixon colours on there, but it's, it's not a J. Arthur Dixon postcard, it's an actual photograph. Um, I never saw her, sadly. She was withdrawn in 1981, before I was born. But she wasn't broken up till 1998. I've got video of her being broken up, and uh, some of the lads I work with now were literally poking their fingers through a hull. So many people wonder why she wasn't saved. It just wasn't possible. Although, uh, it would have been nice. I've worked with skippers who, who sailed her, and she never had a bow thruster fitted like Turn did later on. And They said that in a north wind, turning her at lakeside, you had to start your turn about half a mile before you even got to the pier because you'd just be coming sideways down the lake giving it all you could to get it round. But, uh, yeah, she was, um, a pretty, she was 150 feet long. Here she was coming into Waterhead. No safety at all on the pier. <laughs> Can't even tell who the pier man is. <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, that, that was the cover of one of my books. It's a, I think that's a really cracking photograph. If it's got a little ghost in the corner, it's a Furnace Railway official postcard, and on eBay that just means they go for silly money. 
Now the third vessel that came down the slip in 1879, a week after Teal, was Britannia, but it wasn't the same slip. It was 500 metres away across the water at Fell Foot. So we had Signet, Teal and Britannia. Britannia was built as a private steamer for Colonel Rydell, another Cess product. He had uh, Fairy Queen built before her, but we're not doing private steam today. But he was really innovative. Um, she had a bow thruster in 1879. She had a jet here, and what it would do, really inefficiently and pretty uselessly, it would blow jets of steam out the side in an experiment to see if it would help the boat turn. She cost more, she cost £12,000 in 1879, which was more than every other railway steamer at the time put together. Um, she came into ownership of the railway in 1908. They got a ticket for her for 122 passengers, but she never saw service on passenger runs. She was the charter boat, director's yacht. She was too, too good, as you can see from the saloon image there. Uh, sadly, I don't know if she was too expensive to run or post-war they just didn't want her, but she was laid up during the war and uh, scrapped afterwards. Parts of her remain at the Steamboat Museum but that's literally just a bit of stained glass uh, from, from this, actually. There she is laid up in the water, lakeside. Um, 1916. Now, during the war, all the steamers were laid up at lakeside. You'll see some of these pictures about claiming to be the Second World War. During the First World War, Raven was used for testing mine laying equipment, and this can only be the First World War because this fella here, Hiram Maxim, died in 1916. So this has to be during the First World War. She was also used during the Second World War for testing mine laying equipment. Uh, Maxim, of course, was to do with Vickers of Maxim, Son and Barrow, shipbuilders. Um, but uh, quite interesting to see uh, the vessel used for that purpose. After the war, it's what I call the watershed for the Windermere services. The um, winter service had run at a loss, it had run at a loss continuously. And during the war, the road down the east side of the lake was completed. This road put the railway, um, sorry, the cargo vessel Raven out of use. Trucks could now head at the lake. It also put the winter boats out of use. There was no need for a winter service. As you can see, the bus took over in the winter of 1920. And uh, buses, of course, aren't winter only. They run in summer as well. So this is when I say the boats went from being a vital part of the local transport network into the tourist uh, network that they still are. The first boat in 1921 was no longer 7.30, 7.50. It was 10 to 10, one of the many reasons I worked there. You don't have to get up at 5 a.m. <laughs> and that's continued uh, to this day. The LMS took over in 1923, or the FR, Furnace Rail was incorporated into the LMS, and uh, they continued the cutbacks. They converted the uh, Signet to paraffin in 1924. If you've got a Duckworth and Langmuir, open it up and see what they say about that. They were not favourable at all. I think something along like, she vibrates your teeth out or something. Um, the sister ship, Teal, was withdrawn in 1927, and... The weekday service was just two boats, and the weekend service uh, was three boats if required. They did continue. I, again, I haven't touched on them, I haven't got time. The Furnace Railway was built for cargo and freight, but that declined as soon as the railway was completed, so they moved on to tourists, and they developed loads of tours throughout the lakes. And the LMS continued these. You know, you get the train from Barra up to Lakeside, get the steamer up, uh, coach around the top, uh, you could, you could, could add a cruise on Coniston to it, but they had five or six tours. And then we're going to have a picture of a boat on a train. Here we go. This is the Teal. These tours that the LMS had really took off. They were um, attracting day trippers because the Holiday Pay Act of the 1930s meant that people could have a day out without having to forfeit wages. They ordered three ships as part of a massive upgrade. Um, you might be surprised at one of them. Uh, Teal came first, built by Vickers Armstrong, Barrow and Furnace. I think this is the port bow, that's the bar. And uh, she came by rail to Lakeside where she was put together and launched. And interestingly, I've done winter maintenance for 10 or so years and 
when you take parts of it apart now, like the, say the, the stair rail, if you flip it over to scrape it before you varnish it, it says PN726, part number 726, because they literally had a jigsaw plan of how to put it together. Here she is, fantastic photo from 1946. This gate separated first and second class. And um, you can see she was, her exhaust, she didn't have funnels. She was a, sorry, she wasn't a steamer, she was a motor ship. Her exhaust came out at the waterline. We've since changed that. So we, they since changed that. Um, by putting, filling this in and putting an engine room there. But uh, that's just a cracking picture. And there you go, look, four windows, not five like this one. The second ship they built, the LMS, was for their subsidiary company, the Caledonian Steam Packet. Some of you may have sailed on here. That's the Countess of Bredalburn on Loch Orr. See how she's a one-third scale version of teal almost. Uh, uncanny in resemblance. Um, when I saw those pictures, I almost thought it was teal the first time. But uh, you know, even down to the same belting position at the front and the stern, the same deck layout, everything. Following on from the success of Teal, 1936, repeat order for our lake, of course, was the Swan of 1938. Sadly, she never reached her potential of 817 passengers when launched, because a year later, the uh, Second World War broke out. This is a later image, again. Um, when you look at the images, they're quite hard to date, but some, sometimes they've got stairs down the front, sometimes they don't, sometimes they've got this side closed in. It's, they change so frequently. I've had to keep notes since I've been there, just so I can ID pictures of the last 15 years. And here she is in 1986, coming into Bourness under uh, Orange Express by this time, ownership. Um, she looks particularly good uh, there. Still haven't got the funnels added at the back. Um, still exhausting down at the waterline. During the Second World War, Swan, Teal, Swift and Signet tied up down at Lakeside and a chap called Alf Mawson was paid to come and turn the engines and uh, keep them in working condition. Turn and Swift were the only steamers. Signet, remember, was converted to paraffin in 1924. Turn was up at Bowness as a Sea Scout training vessel. She was nicknamed HMS Undy after the submarine uh, that had been adopted by uh, Ambleside for the duration of the war. A couple of years after the war, well, after the war there was a bit of a coal shortage. Turn and Swift didn't sail much. Signet bolstered services issued by the motor ships. Um, British Railways took over the LMS in 1948 and they set a target to convert the remaining steamships into motor vessels. Um, that's actually the next slide, which I'll come to, but kind of in the wrong order. This isn't just any image of Swift. This is Swift on her last ever passenger run in September 1981, uh, coming back down uh, to Lakeside. So this is Swift getting converted. So sorry about the quality, it's the only ones I've got. Um, Turn was meant to be converted in 1956 from steam to diesel, but Swift wasn't happy about that and threw a tantrum and bowed out of the 1956 season in early August after a boiler failure. So they converted her first and then Turn was converted over the winter of 57-58. They lost their big funnels and uh, received you know, their little uh, motor funnels that they've got there. This is where Swift and Turn were always tied up, right down the bottom of the, uh, the pier at Lakeside with Swan and Teal in front. Now I'm going to move on to the smaller boats and then I'll come back to today in Swift. So remember we had Billy Barmer, Willie, William Garnett taking people around the lilies? Well, the launch operations continued um, after the advent of steam using steamboats. It's very similar to what you had at Ballach. But the problem with steam is you could have all the customers in the world and no steam up, or you could have steam up and no customers. So the first motorboat on the lake in 1898 really set a change. And this picture is taken around the turn. That's steam, that's steam, but that's motor. A motorboat, you could fire it up when you had the customers, you could knock it off and go home when there was no one there. A few motor companies developed. This is the Windermere Motor Launch Company. Uh, the next three slides, the maps and the, thing, the uh, literature is just fantastic. So they started in 1927. All three of those boats came to Ballach um, for various operators. 
this but this company became the Bonus Bay Boating Company in 1933. Um, all those three boats are still sailing today. In fact, in fact, yeah, we've still got all those three. Um, that one on the left is at Stratford, and I'll talk about him soon. Up at Ambleside, you had the Ambleside Motor Launch Company, who really truncated the Bowness to Lakeside half of the lake, which is actually about a mile longer than that half. Um, they operated more motorboats from the head of the lake, Princess Queen, Spray, Lotus, and here is Queen and Spray, Spray being the smaller one. A few private operators were out on the lake, Langdale Chase had Florette, Joe Huddleston had have a go, and if anybody here went to Loch Rannoch in 1976 and saw this boat, please let me know, because I've tried to trace the history of all these boats, and according to Duckworth and Langmuir, have a go, went to Loch Rannoch, and I know somebody in Bowness who said he towed her up there, but never seen a picture or heard anything of her since she got there. There were so many wrong, uh, wooden boats on the lake, I've tried to collate a list, builders, information of them all, but it's a very difficult task. I kind of, there's 90 plus over the years. Um, you know, the big ones came about in the 1930s. These ones are a bit older. But Nick Birch, who owns Avon Boating in Stratford, is doing a great service. He's got five ex windermere boats in immaculate condition. Uh, they're electric and they run up and down the Avon, for six pounds for a 40 minute cruise. So if you ever find yourself there, do pop down. Again, we've got the Swift in the background there. Now the railway to Lakeside opened in 1869, became summer only in the 1930s. And in the 60s, it was a victim of Dr. Beeching. And what did for the railways was great for the launches in Bowness. The coach park developed, the coach trade developed, a good tout could get a coach party off a coach and onto a launch before a steamer was even sighted. The shift of passion to transfer moved from Lakeside to Bowness. Lakeside started to die a death. 60% of the passengers um, after the 60s were coming through Bowness. To, comp to move on with the coach trade, the water bus, the wooden launches evolved into the water buses. We've still got this one, Venture. She was the first one, 1966, she's electric. All these three came to Loch Lomond, to Mullins. Uh, that was Loma Made 1, that was Loma Made 2. This one, still there, I saw it today, tied up at Bella. She's Glen Fella, taking you across to Lust, maybe. Uh, that one's now on the Tyne, that one whereabouts unknown, last seen in uh, Wales. Then we got the Cumbrias. Miss Cumbria, 1974, we've still got her. Um, we're using it quite a lot at the moment for training new skippers, and she's seen here being built at Zandam at Molinars in Holland. We ordered three of them, 1974, 77 and 79. Then we got Miss Westmoreland in 85, this fine ship in 88. Then we got a Clyde ship in 92, Sir William Wallace from Munro, that took you from the Broomy Law down to the Garden Festival. And then we got this other one, Lakeland 2, in 1992 as well. And what had happened over the preceding 30 years is the Bonus Bay Boat and Company had amalgamated with the Ambleside Motor Launch, it had built itself up, it was carrying the majority of the passengers. The steamers were declining, declining. They went through various ownerships, British Railways, British Railways Board, Sealink, Orient Express, James Sherwood. In fact, there's a steam in the background there, isn't there, Teal? But um, in 1993, the Bonus Bay Boat and Company took out a loan, purchased the steamers, and since 1994, we've, they've all appeared on the same literature. Most people think the steamers bought the little boats. No, the little guy bought the big guy. And uh, the guys who did it are quite proud of that, so I've got to get that the right way around. So this is how we operate today. This map is the wrong way around, and it's really annoying. I can't get it the right way around without flipping the right in. Lakeside at the south end, we run a little wooden boat across to Fell Foot during the summer. The yellow cruise runs every day, apart from Monday to Friday in January. The blue cruise and the red cruise run every day except for Christmas Day. The green cruise runs all summer. We also do a little boat from Bowness to the ferry landing in competition to the car ferry. We've got 17 boats. This is the turn as she looks today. Steam profile was returned in 1991 for her centenary. Teal, you don't need to count the windows now to tell them apart. Easy to tell apart, different lower bar windows. They're not changing the Swan. Uh, it altered the vessel structurally uh, and we don't want to do the same to Swan. 
Here's the X-Clyde one, Cumbria 4. She's currently getting a new engine refit. Uh, Princess and Miss Lakeland. During the winters, we don't lay everybody off. We've got about 80 core staff and 100 seasonals. During the winters, we're always busy. This is a couple of years old. This is putting the new generator in Swan. Now this Swan and Teal have got two main engines and two generators. This was repla replacing the starboard gen set a couple of years back. We replaced the port gen set this year, took out the Perkins, put in a, another Volvo D7. The entire fleet, apart from Venture, that is electric, and Swan and Turn, are now Volvo, ranging from D2 in Mural and Sunflower to D13 in Teal. Um, the generators on Swan and Teal are also D7. Uh, so basically on a Cumbria, it's the same thing, just without the generator unit. Um, on board. This was also the year she was getting a new wheelhouse, so that would be 2019. On our slipway, we've got two. Every five years we take out the car ferry, that's great fun. About 4am we get a Miss Cumbria either side and we tow her down to Lakeside at about two knots and put her on the uh, slipway there. Normally obviously it's reserved for our fine vessels. At Ambleside we've got the small boathouse, this was just before Christmas when we took Lakeland out. She just fits. See, this is the same boat on the other slide that had a wheelhouse. If you look very carefully above that middle life ring, you can see the top of a wheel. Some poor sod has to drive that 10 and a half miles up the lake without a roof because we take the wheelhouse off at one end of the lake and then slip it at the other. Where's the logic in that? And now we're moving on to where I spend most of my time, which is the new Swift. Sorry about it being right up there. Uh, this is the first picture I ever took of Swift in May 2019. I sent it to John. And... Uh, she grew pretty quickly. The company wanted a vessel to sail all year round of steamer standard, and they approached a number of British shipyards to no avail. So in the end, they settled with Damon uh, in Holland, Gorin Chem, where they're based. The whole sections were uh, subcontracted out to their, their own yard in Kolsey in Poland, and they came in seven sections. This is Swift at... Uh, the service is just south of Kendall on the motorway, and this is her coming over Newby Bridge at 4 a.m. I got up ridiculously early for that, but it's a one-off photo there. Um, she was, so that first picture was May. She was ready for launch in November and December 2019. She went together in our own car park. You can see her down there. So normally we lift the wooden boats out down there, but this is I stood on the roof of Princess here as we're craning them off. Um, we had to put the boats further up. She was built on a two degree cant, which they had to account for in all their plans um, at Lakeside. Uh, and I kept on, I shouldn't say this because it's going on YouTube, but the crew would finish early on a Saturday and I'd sneak up on a Saturday after they'd gone home and have a little rummage around, have a look inside, see what was going on. Now to move her, because she was built right down there. And they had to move her all the way along, past the aquarium, into between these two, the two biggest mobile cranes in Britain, which they brought up from a power station they're dismantling down south. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, and you don't appreciate how little room there was there. They had two SBMT self-propelled modular um, units to move her up the, up the um, side of the aquarium and into position, and there's literally inches I was there, I was with the digger with the boss and we were, we were moving pot plants, we were cutting trees down and everything just to, to squeeze it past. You can see up there, actually, it's not going so well. Um, this this uh, the little duck pond they've got at the aquarium was really close. I was at my kid's nativity that day, though, so these aren't my pictures. Priorities. <laughs> I was there for the launch the next day, though. Here she is, ready to go in. Um, we had the director's boat, so I couldn't be two and Lakeland two there. Uh, swan down the back. Um, 17 tonne per foot uh, they worked it out at when they did all the pressure testing of the car park. There was a bit of a worry lifting her in, but all went well. And uh, she entered the water on the 11th. So this was the 10th, but she entered the water the day after, on the 11th of December 2019. After trials, um, well, it was delayed actually for obvious reasons during COVID. She didn't enter service until October 2020, almost a year later. We, we started training on her in September 
and she got her MCA ticket in uh, late October and we entered service on about the 26th, 27th, 2020. This is where I spend most of my time in summer, um, probably familiar to some of you. It's a whole new ball game for me. All our other boats have got a wheel and a stick that goes forwards and backwards, or two if you're on a steamer. This hasn't got anything like that, and um, it's just like starting again. It was fantastic, a really nice challenge to, uh, to take on. It looks quite complicated, but it's really not. Most of those buttons do light switches and window wipers or call for a coffee, that sort of thing. It's, uh, <laughs> in fact, these lights, all these lights do is tell you doors are closed. It looks a lot more complicated than it is. Um, so that's, yeah, that's just, I took these the other day uh, before I came up. This is the upstairs saloon. It's designed in summer to be semi-open. So all these windows open electronically on this uh, panel here. Doors are all open, of course. So in summer, it's like an upper deck on a steamer. Um, you get the wind blowing through, it's nice. In winter, we've got the heaters, it's warm, but you get a cracking view. Downstairs, um, all these windows, have got these little boxes in, they're like your rear windscreen on your car. So when everybody's getting on with wet coats, misting up the windows, you just bang the window heaters on and it's great, it doesn't mist up, it's nice and warm. It's got USB charging at each seat because that's what the, the norm is nowadays. Um, but uh, yeah, it's very good for charters. Downstairs, this is the technical room. We've got two five ton fuel tanks and the switchboard. Again, it looks complicated, but as long as everything's green, it's all right. Uh, that just means the shore power's on. Um, so she's got two Volvo D9 generators. She's a diesel electric vessel. I don't know if it's the same as Talisman, but she's got two generators that provide electricity for everything on board and, and everything, including the propulsion units, are electric. So we've got two um, 155 kilowatt motors, which are directly mounted onto the pods, which we'll see in a minute. And each generator puts out 300 kilowatts. So there's loads of overhead for the hotel, you know, uh, the, the, the bar and everything else. This is just another view. We've got uh, fresh water, sewage, another fuel tank, the builds manifold, and then through that door, we've got the transformers there, through that door we've got the two D9s. Um, it's not like the engine room on Waverley, everybody wants to see it and it's just a noisy green box. But um, that's the engines for those of you who want to see them. We do have a little bow thruster at the front, there's a bow thruster tunnel just visible past the escape ladder. And pretty hard to get a picture down the back. So we've got the steering reservoir, sends oil down to the motor down here on the pod unit. And then this is the uh, electric motor directly mounted uh, onto the pods, which spin 360 degrees. There's two at the back and then the bow thruster at the front. So she's a highly maneuverable vessel. We can't have one at the front, which would be ideal because the lake obviously comes up at the sides and we go bow in, we'd, we'd, we'd hit the bottom. And this is what it's all about. This is why we do the job. In summer, try and get the sun coming down between the pikes. Um, just pootling around on the evening cruise. I, I, I think this was a wedding actually, but um, you know the view from the boat is absolutely fantastic. Massive windows all the way around. The bridge has got 360 degree degree view. And then the last slide is just what I'm doing now. So if you come down to the lake, ask for me. I'll always show you around, give you a tour. Um, from the beginning of our summer timetable to the new year, you'll find me on Swift uh, five days a week. I share it with me. I was up there on this picture because I was on one of these. Because January, February, March, you'll find me helping uh, Bernard here and we train the new skippers. Every year we put new skippers through. Um, so we were just getting them to tow a Miss Cumbria into uh, Brockhall with the wind. It's a good pier because we can smack it and no one's there to watch. <laughs> no, they're all very good. They're all very good. Um, so, uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. What I've tried to get across with that talk is how the lake, everything around the lake is dependent on the lake, and the lake has helped create an entire ecosystem around it. You know, the, from sustaining people with food, work, leisure, everything relies on the lake. I love the place, fascinated by it, how it's helped develop everything. Um, like I say, come down, come for a sail. Ask for Rob, they're used to it. I mean, a lot of you here, <laughs> Angus, come down, which boat's Rob on, you know, and uh, they'll point you in my direction unless I'm having a bad day. And uh, I'll give you a tour of whatever boat I'm on. So, um, yeah, thank you. Well 
If it doesn't park up at Millport, it's not the talisman. That's the difference. Uh, thank you so much, Rob. That was just a fascinating... What, what came through to me was the enthusiasm. And uh, you certainly whet my appetite to come back down to your part of the world and revisit things. Sorry. To, to revisit you, because uh, that was just a fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Um, you won't see me next time. You'll see me the time after. But in the meantime, uh, thank you so much again for that talk. It was just fantastic, really enjoyable, and um, enjoy the rest of the evening. Cheers. Thank you.